Coming up on Tech News Today, how flashy is Sony's new XQD memory card? We'll talk to Trey Ratcliffe to find out. Also, is Siri eating up all the bandwidth? And Google TV set to conquer CES. So are we. All that and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, January 6, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle your used electronic gadgets from your home or office. Don't just sell it, Gazelle it. Gazelle your used gadgets today at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Ayaz Akhtar. And I'm Jason Howell. And we are doing our last show before we head off to Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show. Lots of big news coming out of there already. It feels like we've been at CES for a week with all the announcements uh, coming. Today, uh, Sony announcing the new XQD memory cards and the Nikon D4 also announced as the first camera that will take advantage of them. We got Trey Ratcliffe. Uh, you guys know Trey Ratcliffe, travel photographer extraordinaire, uh, stuckincustoms.com, and uh, he's down in L.A. at the Google headquarters right now. Uh, first of all, Trey, I um, always uh, love your photography on Google+. Plus. It just makes me angry how good you are. No, don't say that. It should. I hope it inspires you. <laughs> it does. Out. It does. I'm only kidding. Uh, you, you have great stuff. And uh, I'm glad you were able to take some time to talk with us about the stuff today because I'm I'm a photo I'm not even a noob I'm, I don't even know enough to be a photo noob you're a photo agnostic I, I'm, I'm photo <laughs> ignorant uh, Nikon announcing the D4 the XQD format uh, for the for the card now the D4 will still take compact flash but the XQD format seems to have people pretty excited it's gonna come in two flavors 16 gig and 32 gig based on PCI Express however it's uh, transfer rate is 125 megabits per megabytes. second megabytes per second thank you uh, that's that's not necessarily the fastest. I mean, you can get a compact flash that's faster than that, can't you? Yeah, there are a few very fast, high-end um, compact flash cards. Like, um, I used one from Hoodman that's extremely fast and very professional grade. They're very expensive, but they're very fast. The XQD is neat because it's sort of a standardized speed, like Thunderbolt. Gotcha. So, and, and what, what is it that you need the speed for when you're taking pictures? What's the advantage of having that? And what and essentially is the advantage to XQD in being standardized? Well, it's a little bit ahead of its time. I'm not sure the Nikon D4 needs it. Because the Nikon D4 uh, can shoot, I think it's 11 frames per second. And that'll write very efficiently to the existing line of compact flash cards. The only situation in which the XQD will come in handy is you'll notice that what happens is you'll fire away at 11 frames per second and then keep up for a few seconds, but then it starts to click slower. You might get three frames per second. That's because the speed at which it writes to the card slows down. It starts to do this thing called buffering. The XQD will let it go for longer before buffering. Uh, this is still sort of an edge case because most of your high speed situations are for sports or wildlife or rockets taking off or something. And those only last about two or three seconds anyway, like a touchdown catch or diving for a first down. You don't necessarily need to keep shooting at that rate of speed for like 20 seconds. So if I'm excited about the Nikon D4, should I go out and drop $130 on a 16 gig XQD card, or should I just stick with, with compact flash? You should, and then you should start covering NASCAR. <laughs> that, that sounds like that's because the case. Because <laughs> a perfect card for those sorts of things. Yeah, it's uh, 130 bucks for the 16 gig Sony XQD. 32 gig card will run $230. Uh, there's also a USB 3 card reader and an express card adapter. Each of those is $45. Who should get these, do you think, Trey? I think the only people that make use of them will be uh, like pro sports photographers. They'll be uh, they'll be the best um, case for this this situation. Most people don't uh, don't even need this. You know, if you compare the D4, which by the way is quite a disappointment to me, if you compare the D4 to the Canon 
Uh, One DX that was announced three months ago, the Canon beats it out in almost every situation, from frames per second to megapixels, and that writes at it even faster frames per second. It does not have this XQD um, type card. It still has the old, and you're still going to be able to take uh, probably even uh, better or as good photos with a Canon. So I don't see any real compelling reason to get this XQD quite yet. It's a, it's early it's an early adopter thing. If you want to try it out, if you're the kind of person that can afford six thousand dollars for the Nikon D4 in February, uh, you you could mess with it. That's what that's what it sounds like. It's it's not an essential for almost anyone. Yeah, I, I hate to see people get too excited about tech just to waste their money. I I prefer people save their money and get something that will really change their photographic life. And this is one of these edge case things that sounds exciting, but Really, it's not a practical application. Now, one one last question before I let you go. Down the road, it sounds like, though, XQD could become something cool because of uh, that standard, that consistency that you're talking about. And uh, it could get up to 250 megabytes per second transfer rates as PCIe evolves, maybe even faster. Yes, clearly, everything is going in a, a faster and more memory direction. And I think this XQD card now is rated up to... 100 frames per second, raw files, which is unbelievable. There's hardly any cameras that can really make any use of that now. Yeah. But it's a little bit like Thunderbolt, right? Like I have a Thunderbolt drive at home and I use it all the time, but that's because I'm sort of a high-end professional and I have uh, you know, many, many terabytes of information that I'm blasting across my Thunderbolt drive. But this is not something that everybody needs. Yeah, it actually reminds me a little of Bluetooth. I remember 1999, 2000, uh, Bluetooth, Bluetooth. Everything we heard about was Bluetooth. But there were very few devices that took advantage of it and very few people who needed it. Of course, these days, Bluetooth is everywhere. People use it for all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's, it's good to know about these things. Trey, thank you so much uh, for taking the time with, to chat with us. It was really helpful in understanding this stuff. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, anything you want to let people know about that you're up to uh, before we let you go? No, as opposed to most people, I have nothing to plug or nothing to talk about. I just, uh, I just put new photos up on Google Plus and, and talk to other people and hang out and just sort of enjoy um, this, sort of, this kind of social photography life. It's kind of a nice way to live. That's fantastic. Thanks, man. Appreciate taking the time. Thanks, Thank Trey. Thanks, Trey. All right, See Trey Ratcliffe. And definitely check out his photos on Google Plus. Just, just search him. T-R-E-Y-R-A-T-C-L-I-F-F-E. Trey Ratcliffe. He's got... Excellent stuff. No E. I there's no E at the end? Did, did I say Oh, no, there's no E at the end. You'll get in trouble if you do that. Rat do Cliffy. That. <laughs> it's not Rat Cliffy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Trey. Uh, Apple's Siri is eating up all the bandwidth, according to a network firm called Arieso. Uh, it's A-R-I-E-S-O. iPhone 4S uses almost twice as much data as the iPhone 4 and nearly three times as much as the 3G, not the 3GS. Uh, the firm uses the 3G as a baseline to be able to compare it to previous studies they've done. The uh, iPhone isn't the only one using up a lot of data. The Samsung Galaxy S also downloads twice as much data as the iPhone 3G. The HTC Desire uploads 3.2 times as much data as the iPhone 3G. Uh, Arieso did their survey based on a European network, 1 million subscribers across a single European network in both urban and rural areas. That They didn't tell us which operator it was. They say that the cause for the iPhone, anyway, is Siri and iCloud. That doesn't seem to add up. I mean, iCloud's available on iOS 5 devices, which includes the iPhone 4, so sure. why would that necessarily be... Well, it, the, the the four there's probably a lot more four users that didn't opt to subscribe to to iCloud than 4S. If you're the kind of person that goes out and grabs the latest new iPhone, you're probably more likely to use the latest new service as well. I'm guessing. Yes, yeah, so instead of just tinkering with your own settings, you would just see that splash screen. Try out iCloud right now as you're yeah. setting up your phone. I guess that's 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 true. But I mean, I like the study because it's got some interesting things about modems, which are like two thousand percent of the amount of data used. It's like, well, of course, they're going to be that way. It's right. Just, just the way it's just the way these uh, things work. I also feel like I mean, even with apps that are being synced over multiple devices, they're still going to make you connect to Wi-Fi if it's over twenty megabytes. Mm -hmm. So this is not huge, huge amounts of data that are there that are passing through the data streams, the three G streams. And I'm sorry, but I have Siri on my iPhone 4S, 
And I know that some people use it really often, but I don't think that many people are using it that much. It's well, a sort of once in a while feature. Ars Technica found that 11 search queries performed on Siri every single day for 30 days over the 3G connection led to an increase of 20 megabytes in data usage. So that's not much. That's no. not enough to cause this. Arieso is arguing it's not the Siri data. It's the fact that when you have Siri, you're more likely to use your phone because you can talk to it and use it for more things and pull up web pages and pull up maps and, and cause data connections. Uh, and, and so you just use your phone more. I guess that could be correlative, not causative. Maybe if you're the kind of person who likes to use data, you're more likely to have the newest phone. Right. It's not necessarily just that you're using Siri and that's the data hog. It's that you're online a lot on your phone, pulling data down in many yeah. ways. And the Samsung Galaxy S doesn't have Siri. The HTC Desire doesn't have Siri. Uh, and they're using a lot of data as it's well. Like I think just more capable smartphones with faster processors and early adopters probably tend to be people that use more data. Like you, like you guys are saying, I'm thinking that's completely right. The idea is the people who buy these phones want to use them to their full capabilities, and an iPhone 4S might make it easier for people who weren't thinking about using Siri to do that off the bat. But if you have a Galaxy or a Google Nexus One or one of these things, you're probably on the cutting edge anyway. So you're like, I'm going to use this like as much as I can, as is shown with the modem stuff too. I'll also, Beatmaster in the chat room brings up a really good point. Uh, the iPhone 4 has a 7.2 megabit per second connection. The iPhone 4S has a 14.4 megabit per second connection. So you can use data faster, which when you've got a faster data connection, you tend to use more data because you get more data in a shorter amount of time. You don't give up and get frustrated like I did on my Edge connection. I ah, forget it. I'm not using this. <laughs> you thing. just hold off the Edge and you go, okay, Wi-Fi. Good. Uh, Kaz Hurai, Kazuo Hurai, uh, is going to be named president of Sony, according to a report in the Nikkei Business Daily in Japan. Uh, president Howard Stringer will remain in place as CEO and chairman, but Hurai will be taking over the presidential duties as early as April. They expect this to be announced sometime later this month. Harai has got a lot of roles right now. Uh, the Verge says that he's currently the executive deputy president. Uh, I would like a title change if that was my title as well. Uh, he's also the chairman of Sony's Computer Entertainment Group. He took that job over in June of last year. Kind of a, a hard time uh, for the PlayStation folks back then. He is the guy who built the PlayStation into what it is today. Uh, and it is one of the most uh, one of the most profitable sectors of Sony, whereas, for instance, the Sony TV section has been losing money. Uh, and he uh, also uh, pri he was named president of Sony's entire consumer business back in March. So he's a star on the rise. Everybody expected him to take over this role. This sounds just like a very simple title. He got two words taken off his title. Instead of deputy. executive, deputy president, now he's president. Right, and Stringer's no longer president. And actually, some, some folks I read speculate that Stringer may actually retire after this happens, leaving yeah, the CEO position transition. open. When Stringer got the position of president and CEO and chairman, he, had, he got him at different times. But when he got it all together, the idea was that Stringer was going to kind of reform Sony because it was so disparate. It was very difficult to get the divisions to talk. And that, that didn't really happen. They were losing money. And they've been, their stock price has been taking a hit since Stringer took over. He was like the, I believe he's the first foreign uh, uh, C, uh, president and CEO and chairman that Sony's ever had because they're Japanese-based companies. Uh, Stringer's, and I believe he's Welsh. And, the, and Kazurai, I mean, if you, if you don't remember him, you probably saw him during those uh, PSN apology videos where he's explaining, right. look, we made a mistake. We're going to take care of this. He became very, very public. He started noticing him, and he seems like he can fit the role. I mean, he was there, and I don't believe a lot of people are still complaining about the PlayStation Network outage. Well, we're sitting here in our bubble saying nice things about Kazurai, but Nick in Gladstone, Queensland, Australia, says we're crazy. Uh, he wrote in and said, hey, I've just read the news that Kaz Harai, the current chief of Sony's PlayStation division, well, he, he actually is more than that now, but, but yes, he's historically the guy in charge of PlayStation, uh, is getting a bump up to president of Sony. While Kaz is well known to gamers as a stand-up guy, I've got to question why he is getting the promotion. This is the guy that was in charge last year when the whole PlayStation Network hack debacle happened, which gave Sony a huge black eye and cost them millions. I don't see why anyone would reward someone so soon after such a major PR and financial stuff-up. What do you guys think? That's crazy, Nick. I'm sorry, Nick. You're absolutely insane. Because the thing is... Really? Yes. No, it seems to make no. sense well, to me. Why is oh, he crazy? Place, okay, look. If this was a... Let's say this was another company, and their system completely failed, and it fell apart, and it affected 77 million accounts. If that brand wasn't destroyed, and it continued throughout the year, and actually had an uptick in sales, like, like the PlayStation did... 
there's no way on earth this guy didn't manage this properly. That's a big, I mean, I know they took a while before they actually, before Sony responded publicly, but they still managed to get through this. This isn't like the television department where, oh yeah, our TV sales are failing, but wait, we don't actually have a solution. PlayStation is still going strong, and even though the, the PSP Vita is still working out there, I mean, they're, they're basically uh, sticking to a, um, what do you call it, like a, a dying kind of form factor there. They're still very strong in the field of home consoles. And, they, and the thing that everything Microsoft's been trying to do with this whole, this is the one box you have in your house. That's what the PlayStation's been pushing for from the beginning, Although and they're getting the there. the Xbox has been beating them It's been, yeah, Microsoft has time. been surprising in that. But yeah. I'm saying to, to even manage this to the point where they still exist as a serious competitor in the field yeah. versus Nintendo, right? Nintendo's got this kind of like, we got the Wii. It's great. You'll love it. And then nothing happens for a while. There's no quick turnaround. Cause has been behind this this turnaround. I, I don't think Nick's well, got a point. Well, you're, but it's almost as if you're saying he did the best possible job through 2011, through some really hard times at Sony. That's right. We don't know that to be true. We know that Sony seems to have weathered the storm, mm -hmm. but hey, maybe it could have been handled better, and they could have been more on top at the end of 2011. So he shouldn't get a promotion. Well, you're, just, you're saying that Nick is crazy because, yes, because Hirai... Uh, did the best job possible. We, we just don't know that to be true. And it wasn't that long ago that we were all snickering at how badly Sony was handling everything with their community. Okay, so maybe Nick's not crazy. <laughs> I disagree <laughs> with Nick strongly. I, yeah, I think That's Nick all. makes some, some reasonable points here. I, I also... You know, when you think about it, he gets a lot of credit for being the guy who made PlayStation happen, uh, and, he, and he should, but the PlayStation 3 is not the success Sony wanted it to be. I'm not saying it's not a success. Sony fanboys settled down. It is. It is a big success, but it's not as big a success. They wanted to dominate with this thing, and it's it's been a contender, you know, and it, it's popped up on top of the charts and sales a couple months, but it hasn't been able to dominate the way the PlayStation 2 did. Well, I'm just thinking about the whole the way that the, even PlayStation existed as a as a failed Nintendo product. Do you remember that the, the history of the PlayStation, how it was going to be the CD-ROM for I think a Super Nintendo, and it wound up becoming the PlayStation, and they turned into this monstrous product. PlayStation Two was pretty cutting edge because that's when Microsoft's trying to figure out how do we do a game console and market to the public, and Microsoft figured it out by the 360. So I mean, I, I think the real point is what's going to happen with the PlayStation Four? I guess where is this going to go? Because these both of these consoles, Microsoft's and and the Sony's are just long in the tooth. It's like you, we're waiting for this rev, and I think the rumor's like, what, June? We'll see something. Yeah, yeah, we'll probably see all of that change uh, come, come this June. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Gazelle. Folks, uh, you got a bunch of old gadgets sitting around. You got those new gadgets for the holidays, right? You got a, maybe a new tablet, new camera, uh, new, new phone, something like that. And, you, and you've got an old gadget sitting around. You can turn it into some cash. Sell it on Gazelle. Earn the cash. You don't have to waste a lot of time and effort with it. It's really easy. Uh, go to Gazelle. It's simple and fast. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Uh, get a free offer for your gadgets. All you do is you, you type in what gadget you have and, and what cables you have, what condition it's in, and they'll tell you how much they can pay you for it. I got a laptop that I sent to them. I'm going to get 450 bucks for. Uh, you select the payment method you want. You can get it as PayPal. You can get it as a check or Amazon gift certificate, Walmart gift card, or you can ask Gazelle to donate the value of your gadget to a charity. Uh, if it if the gadget's worth a buck or more, it qualifies for free shipping. But you're, you've got a good chance of getting some. In fact, I think the average price they pay out is around a hundred bucks. Uh, MP3 players, cell phones, uh, laptops, tablets, cameras. Uh, every gadget worth a dollar or more qualifies for free shipping. It's a great way to get some cash to put towards the latest devices, uh, or maybe just to buy some accessories or some apps for that new device that you've got coming out. Uh, it's it's a a fantastic way to sell your gadgets. And if you're worried about, say, if you're sending it in for recycling, they do responsible recycling. They've been checked out and certified. Uh, if you're wondering, well, wait a minute, I've got a bunch of data on this phone. They'll wipe the data off of your off of your laptops for you, uh, securely wipe it so you're, you're saved from that. What's your gadget worth? Take a minute, go to gazelle.com and find out. Do it now, though, because remember, the longer you hold on to a gadget, the less valuable it is. So don't put it off for too long. Sell that stuff, gazelle.com. We appreciate their support of Tech News Today. Okie dokie. Time for Money Talk. 
Maybe we should. Yeah, maybe we, we need, a, need a. Uh, we, need a <laughs> we do have that transition though with the dollars drop. Oh boy! You're oh asking, yeah, you're asking make me it to rain, this, uh, Jason. How? You can just make it rain while we're talking. Fly. Samsung had a record quarter and HTC didn't, and everybody's looking at that, going, "Hey, those those guys are in the same business." Uh, Samsung Electronics reported a record quarterly profit on Friday, uh, aided by one-off gains and best ever sales of high-end phones. Samsung also weathering a squeeze on its memory chip business. So Samsung does do a lot more than HTC. Uh, they, they make OLED displays. They make mobile processing chips. Those parts of the business are doing well. Uh, HTC reported a dismal fourth quarter. Uh, first quarter is probably looking worse. And they're pinning all their hopes on a mess of devices <laughs> that will be coming out of Mobile World Congress in February. Larry Dignan at ZDNet put it this way. HTC finds itself in a rut that plagues all hardware companies. They just keep putting out devices that people aren't buying. Well, Not they, in great enough numbers. It, anyway. They also, in that in the article, point to the fact that HTC needs thin devices with good battery life that can compete with uh, the other crop on the market right now, of which Samsung has a few. That's fine, but by the time they catch up, then they're still behind a product cycle. Yeah. So nothing about HTC is wrong it's just not fancy and new either well and if you look at samsung a couple of these articles larry's article and one of paid content made this point uh samsung pins all of their hopes on the galaxy when mm -hmm. i say what's the samsung phone now they have more than the galaxy but, but that, you that's think the product it's that comes the galaxy to mind. whether it's the galaxy s2 or the or the you know what or the what note if, yeah, well, the Note is a, is a non-Galaxy phone, right? Yeah. Uh, but most of the time you think, oh, it's one of the Galaxy phones. When I say HTC, is it the Evo anymore? That seems kind of old. That is it the one, Resound? First thing I think of is the Salsa or the Chacha. Is it the, the is it the Salsa or the Chacha? They have that yeah. weird pseudo Facebook phone. The Evo is the brand I think of. Yeah, well, first. and yeah. They, that is an older phone. So right. they, don't, they really, really don't have a franchise phone like an iPhone, mm -hmm. like a Galaxy uh, they, and, and they don't have a lower level. Other, the cha-cha and the salsa are kind funny. of there. But Samsung apparently makes most of their money off the Bada-based phones, not the Android phones, which are counted as smartphones, even though they're very low-end smartphones. And they make a ton of money off feature phones. I mean, it can't just be the, just the operating systems, just the smartphones. I'm thinking Samsung's really diversified. I mean, they, they make the chip for Apple's iPhone, so like an iPad, so they they're going to get money that way too. So I mean, there's some interesting ways that that they are getting revenue versus HTC, which I know they have to pay Microsoft for their Android license still. I think so they're still losing money that way. And the HTC, you guys are right. There's no super phone I could think of. Like I think of like the Titan. I think their Windows phone because I just I just think I've seen it laying around. But not because it's getting huge press. So when you say Titan, I go, oh yeah, the I HTC forgot about Titan. that. Right. Yeah. But it's exactly. not. It's not. Yeah. It is, by the way, the Samsung Galaxy Note. So that is a Galaxy phone. I, is it because I HTC is not so. getting sued by everybody it's like my, like it's Apple? Such a weird well, they did shape. get sued. They got by sued by, by Microsoft, and, saying, like, and, and, and they will get sued that's by how Apple. Don't don't worry about that. Somebody suggested in in the chat room. Simple. No, I think it's because, and I agree with what these articles are saying. Samsung is deep and narrow. They have a lot of phones at a lot of different levels. But you know what the Samsung phone is. The way Apple is actually shallow and narrow, which is we got three iPhone models. That's it. And we used to only have two. And before that, we only had one. So you know it's an iPhone. An iPhone's an iPhone. HTC needs to narrow up its line. Sounds like they're going the opposite way. They're going to come out with a bunch of dual or uh, quad-core devices in February. Uh, and they, they need to have a brand. They need to have a, a single hit phone that everybody wants. And I don't think they, they've had that. And you're right. The Evo is probably the closest they got to it. I'm just thinking, strangely, they were, HTC is one of the first, uh, I guess, manufacturers to make Android really friendly. They had HTC Sense UI on top of Android 1.0, which was pretty rough. And I believe they, they created the G1. That They were, like, the first Android phone. But Samsung's TouchWiz and their basically their styling has gotten Samsung gotten, has gotten very far. And I, th I think it was uh, John Gruber in, in uh, Daring Fireball saying, Oh, so Johnny Ive leads the design team at the two most profitable phone makers. Impressive. Oh, because of Samsung. Yeah. And you know what? That's I don't a, think that's the case. Whether you think Samsung's ripping Apple off or not, the fact that they're comparable is another, is mm -hmm. another issue here, which is Samsung phones look good. You know, if you're an Apple fanboy, you can say, well, they look good because they're ripping off Apple. If you're a Samsung fanboy, you can say, no, we just have really good designers. But e either way, everybody agrees they they're look beautiful great. Beautiful phones. Yeah. And the HTC phones, you know, they're not, they're not butt ugly, but... Nobody's sitting there talking about how, you know, fantastically beautiful they are. 
Maybe some HEC owners are looking at their phones right now saying, you're really pretty. Don't listen to that. <laughs> <Well, laughs> you're smart and you're pretty. Aren't they rumored to be, the, the, to be doing a Facebook phone with Facebook? This was like a rumor last year was floating around that they will have the Facebook phone. Not the well, little chachi thing, that could be the thing that saves them, saves them. If they do the Facebook integrated Isn't phone. Isn't that supposed to come out in the summer, which could be right around the same time the iPhone 5 comes out? Sure. I mean, well, apples no, and iPhone, oranges. I think iPhone 5 will come out in the, fall. in the fall. I think we're on a fall release scale for that, so maybe that would be okay. Okay. Yeah. On to Google TVs. Okay, we all had a good snicker when Eric Schmidt said in six months, most of the TVs you see on the shelves in stores will have Google TV in them. And then yesterday, in News Fuse, we mentioned that three major brands had announced they'll be showing Google TVs at CES. Well, we now have a lot more details here. LG has officially unveiled their Google TV ahead of CES. We'll see it at CES. It's got a modified interface. LG made their own sort of Sense UI TouchWiz kind of layover on the Google TV. Uh, but it will uh, launch in the UK in 2013, supposed to come to the US later this year. And it comes with LG's Magic Remote QWERTY, which is a combination of voice-controlled Magic Remote with a QWERTY keyboard on it. Uh, it's a 55-incher, I think. I think in the test, they, they, they didn't have unspecified. They haven't nailed down yeah. what it, the model's going to be that they sell, but the, the demo one was 55 inches. Sony and Samsung uh, also say they're going to have Google TVs out in the first half of the year. And Vizio. Uh, actually announced last year at CES that they were partnering with Google TV, and they're supposed to be showing one off at CES this year as well. Now, we mentioned yesterday Marvell uh, will have uh, the chips in the new Google They're TV modices. boxes, but also MediaTek is making some ARM-based boxes. And uh, we know a little bit more about that. Marvell's going to have several boxes. MediaTek's going to have several boxes. So we'll have, you know, even though Logitech is pulling out with the review, we'll have a lot of different set-top boxes to look at as well. And uh, and just a note here, while we're talking about Marvell and MediaTek, the LG TV is going to use its own L9 chipset. The others will be using Marvell. I like the look of this. I'm excited to check it out at CES. I wonder how all of these companies skinning their version of Google TV is going to end up cons confusing consumers uh, because you've got a nice look, and then you go to your friend's house, and they have a Google TV too, and you sit down and you go, oh, wait, oh, this is not... I mean, I don't know how different it's really going to be. I, I, you know, I liken it to... Yeah, the Sense UI type of a thing on a phone where you still get that it's Android, even though it looks a little bit different. But I just don't know how that works for a brand that wants to be everywhere, as Eric Schmidt says, in all TVs, not have a unified look and feel. Yeah, right? I, and I don't like the look of it. I mean, it's just a screenshot, but I, I like the new Google TV interface. In fact, the new Direct TV DVR interface mm -hmm. is very similar. And... I like both of them. I, I didn't like the look of that LG. Well, I mean, couldn't it just, uh, when you go from your friend's house to another house and you see the different TV UI, that to me is not that different. I mean, if you go from a, a Sony to a Panasonic, you'll see that anyway. The fact that it's running Android, I mean, Google, I don't think gives, they don't care what it looks like on the outside as long as they can collect data of your usage, what you're searching for, what you're watching. And if they're serving up the videos, I don't really think they care. And that's why Android does have all those skins because it's not really relevant how, uh, how Google is seen. It's really seen how... If, if Panasonic has a, a UI, that's great, which they, they're not a part of this, but Sony probably will, and LG, they, they have their own versions of it, but you can get the same application. So now you have the developers working. They're all on the same TVs. Once you go to the application, it's going to look the same anyway. It's just the first screen you see will be like, okay, is this start on the left or the right? Or is this over here or over there? But apart from that, once you go to the Facebook app, it'll be the same app you're probably used to on every other TV. And it's still blocked. The Chrome browser is still blocked for many websites. That's not, that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be relying on apps, and we still have yet to see a, a lot of good apps in this marketplace. They, they may come, but... I think the move to ARM is going to be a big deal, because when Logitech was sticking to Intel, there's only one manufacturer you can go to for this chip versus ARM. There's so many different companies you can get your own. I mean, the ARM design is licensable. You're going to see that you've got Marvell in there, you've got MediaTek. This is just not a commodity, but it's a lot, there's a lot more competition in this field. And plus... I mean, a lot of the phones out there, like almost every phone, I think, for Android is running ARM. I mean, they're on ARM already. So to move an application over, no special things needed. Let's move on to Symantec, uh, confirming that the Indian hackers, the lords of Dharma Raj, have gained access to older versions of Norton Antivirus source code. Uh, in fact, CNET reports that the two products in question are the Symantec Endpoint Protection 11.0 and Symantec Antivirus 10.2. 
Now, Symantec antivirus is currently at version 12, and the Symantec endpoint protection is four years old, and both of the versions that the source code was obtained for are enterprise versions, not consumer versions. Symantec initially thought that they had only gotten documentation until a uh, few files showed up from Yama Tough at InfoSec Island that appeared to contain the source code from the 2006 version of Norton Antivirus. And uh, Symantec has now confirmed, yes, they, they do have source code of older enterprise versions. Rob Rockwell, Director of Security Strategy at Imperva, is quoted by CNET, News Scientist, and Security Week, uh, saying, look, certainly this is a concern, but really what you want if you want to hack antivirus is you want to hack the signatures. You want the signature files. Just getting the source code to the program itself, especially four-year-old so source code, is not going to do you a lot of good as a hacker. Unless you work for a competing uh, antivirus company and you want to really get a better idea of how Symantec built things from the ground up. Right. He said it actually could old, benefit still... the competitors more, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, it's not the consumer version. So, uh, you know, if you're an enterprise, this is more of a concern uh, than the consumer version. But still, it's a black eye. It's embarrassing for somebody like Symantec to get hacked. They didn't get hacked themselves. Apparently, it was a military website, an Indian military website that was hacked. And that's where the source code was uh, obtained. Uh, but still, you know, you're a security company. Your source code gets out there even at four years old. You can't no, be happy good. about that. Let's move on to the news views. BitTorrent, the company, released a new free application called Share that aims, and not C H E R either, it's S H A R E, uh, that aims to make it easy to share files with friends. It's available at getshareapp.com. BitTorrent promotes the app as a way to send large files because there are no size limits and you can share with groups. The app is designed to make it easier for people to use BitTorrent as a distribution medium. Share is available on Windows or in the latest version of uTorrent on Mac, but beware, it's in alpha. Toshiba confirmed with Engadget and CNET that it's launching a 55-inch 4K 3D TV that does not require glasses. Scheduled to launch in the first quarter of this year with a $10,000 price tag. Watching in 2D gives you 4K resolution, but moving to 3D means that you're watching in 720p HD. The TV uses face tracking to support up to nine viewers. Um, and other glasses-free uh, 3D news, Master Image will show off two such displays for smartphones and tablets at next week's CES. On to the rumor mill. Dang it. No, no, that's wrong. You got one job. That's not that horse. It's not one job. Trust me. Digitimes. Our old pal Digitimes reports that Apple is launching two iPads this year. Digitimes cites component makers saying to expect an iPad 3 in March. It's a couple months from now. And an iPad 4 in October. The 3 would have an HD display and the 4 would have... Upgraded hardware and apps. Well, no kidding. Uh, now, there's something more. Uh, there's something more that's mill than rumor. Code within iOS 5.1 beta shows that the OS will be able to support quad-core processors, both 9 to 5 Mac and Ars Technica. Think that this means Apple is already testing out quad-core devices right now. According to a Dow Jones Newswire's report, Sprint CEO Dan Hess said Sprint deals with data hogs by knocking them off the network and slowing down about a one percent of its customers. Oh, Sprint promotes itself as the last major network with unlimited data. They make no bones about it. It's unlimited. Unlimited means unlimited, right? That got people kind of upset to hear Hess saying that. Sprint's official blog responded to the report saying that it does not throttle its customers. And Hess was referring to terminating services of subscribers who violate the terms of service, either by roaming uh, or by abusing, uh, say, using your phone as a modem to hook up a bunch of servers or something. Still, I don't know. Unlimited supposed to mean unlimited. So, sounds like a caveat to me. Are you done? Mm. <laughs> Speaking to CNBC, Barnes & Noble CEO William Lynch said even if the Nook becomes a business and it's spun off as an independent entity, the device will still be the Barnes & Noble's e-reader. Lynch didn't provide details as to whether the company is seriously considering the Nook spinoff and also said there will always be bookstores in this country. Such an optimist. 
He didn't say there will always be Barnes and Noble, Noble bookstores. Books in this yeah, country. yeah. I know. Everybody agree. There will always be bookstores. Very vague, Lynch. Well yeah. played. There will always be like horse and, and buggy repair places as long as there's the Amish too. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> According to Secularts, the rabbit worm has stolen at least 45,000 Facebook login credentials. The goal of the worm is to gain remote access to networks by posting malicious links on Facebook. Secularts believes that crooks will attempt to use the same credentials on other sites like Gmail or Outlook Web Access. But that won't work, right? Because you use a secure and different password for every site you use, right? Okay, good. Oh, wait. Am I supposed to do that? I think we were oh, supposed man, to do that. Oh, man, that's a lot of work. Now, if you grew up in the 1980s, you know you can't ever be too thin, too rich, or have too many operating systems. Nokia just bought Smarter Phone. Not smartphone, smarter phone, a small company that makes operating systems for feature phones. Nokia already uses Symbian for its low-level phones and Windows Phone for its premium phones, but it is said that it's going to phase Symbian out. However, they did not comment on how the new smarter phone OS will play a part in its offerings. MCVUK.com reports that the next PlayStation and the next Xbox will be shown at E3 this coming June. Doesn't necessarily mean that the next-gen consoles will be available to buy this year, but at least we'll get a glimpse into the future of gaming in June. That's what we hope, anyway. Also expected are details about the already announced Nintendo Wii U. Now, that article, by the way, didn't use any weasel words. It says it will be there in June, so it's on you, MCVUK.com. Well, yeah. yeah, that's right. Corning will show off its next generation of Gorilla Glass at CES. If you're unfamiliar with Gorilla Glass, many smartphones use it to protect your touchscreens. There are sparse details about Gorilla Glass, too, other than it will have better response to touch, be more durable, and can be used for smaller and larger surfaces than currently possible. Last year, they were letting people, like, hit the Gorilla Glass yeah, with yeah. a hammer, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to do that again. I just want to drop stuff from three feet and not break it. Three feet? Yeah. Well, how, about, how about I want to see a gorilla off a building? Try to break it. Yeah, where's okay. the gorilla? You always That's hear, what yeah. the next right. version will have, right? Exactly. It comes with a free gorilla. A tablet and a gorilla. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. That can't break the glass. That's the magic. Speaking of gorillas, time for the randomizer. Randomizer. Actually, there, there are no gorillas. I was going to say, are you calling I New, thought you were going New York I, Mayor I know, Michael I gotta, Bloomberg? I've got to distance myself from that comment because I am not calling New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg a gorilla. Uh, in fact, I'm commending him for taking an online computer coding course. Uh, he's joining 180,000 people taking part in Code Year, a campaign to encourage more people to program. This, this is a good thing. He said, my New Year's resolution is to learn to code with Code Academy in 2012. He wrote this on he wait, he wrote this on Twitter. Actually, Everybody's you know writing what? this he, on Twitter. He didn't write this on Twitter. This is just one of those automated stupid things that that tweets to your Twitter profile when you so, sign up at Code Academy. And I'm not saying that's a bad service he's because he's not actually it's, going to learn to code. Well, he might be. Me, what I'm saying is that he didn't actually say this with like glee and, you know, feeling inspired. This is just he didn't a write stupid this himself. thing. This is that people have been spamming Twitter for a few days now. You I know you guys have seen this. I just I'm thought sorry, everybody just, was doing this because it seemed well, like the thing to do. And they do. just Learning happened to, to all be saying it in exactly the same way. Well, it's how many just ways like, can you say no, this? Of course. They wrote an article as if Mayor Bloomberg said this, and it's actually just Code Academy's. You well, know, if, it's, it's, if it's on Twitter, it's got to be true. This. Yeah, it's an automated tweet. All right. So everyone just calm down. Okay. Although he might become a coder, uh, which is probably he good. He might become a presidential candidate, too, though. So Who we can, can just code? Put that in the line of. Things that he might be. Who knows how to write and see. That would be awesome. Actually. I think so, too. Let's uh, then... Get awesome move. in the calendar? Yeah. Okay. What she said. If you've got a TiVo Premier DVR, you might. You might be one of the random users to have already received an update that adds multi-room streaming between TiVo boxes, an HD guide, a Hulu Plus search, a few other features like that. Come with a gorilla. No, no, sadly, no. Although it might in, you know, the next version. So. Uh, Multi-room streaming will be turned on, though, uh, but that's when the update reaches everybody. Via Stat has announced it's going to start offering 12 megabit per second satellite internet plans on January 16th. 50 bucks per month rolled out, uh, rolled out over the U.S. over the coming months to subscribers of National Rural Telecommunications Cooperative ISPs. Say that three times fast. The low, lowest tier plan is actually going to limit users to 7.5 gigabytes of usage per month. And there's a fee Ooh, if wow. you go over. 7.5? And the service is only available as part of a 24-month contract. So read the fine print. Yeah. This is no light squared. <laughs> it's no, satellite, so it's definitely really not. Out Via there. sat.
And I wanted to make sure that everybody knows we're going to CES, baby. We are. Twitch we're CES what? coverage starts Sunday night. That's in two days. We'll be live from CES Unveiled starting at 5 p.m. Pacific time. I think so. Are you going? In fact, you guys are going to start off the show. Oh. That's we're you. We're covering we it. Live go. Pacific time. Oh, I'm not getting there till Monday. But we'll all, all of us Slacker. will be on TNT uh, all week, Monday through Friday, at our normal time from uh, the South Hall. So if you happen to be at the show, please come and say hi. Watch an episode of TNT. We're shooting a little bit early on Friday, but for the most part, regular yeah. times. An hour earlier place. than the normal time on Friday. But Monday through Thursday, same old, same old time if you're on the stream. Our goal is to make you feel like you're at CES without the pain in your feet or the smell of smoke. Who's smoking? In the, in the uh, casinos. Whenever oh. you're walking through the lobbies oh, on your way yeah. to the See, press conferences I'm kind of just, stuff. you know, I'm, I'm going to stay professional. After a day of gadgets, I'm going to go back to the hotel, recharge. But no, we're doing digital experience on Monday. You're going to have to walk through a casino to get there. Oh, mm, yeah, true. No. So you I, can't avoid it. It gets in my hair. So put on your sneakers, uh, pour yourself your favorite beverage, and then sit back and relax and while say, we, do we do all do the, the heavy work for say, you. Say, look at how tired they seem. <laughs> <laughs> I could be that tired, too, well, but I'm not. Well, also be excited. There's lots of cool toys there. <laughs> no, it's going to be awesome. Let's, Let's move on to what's it. incoming. Incoming message. Hey, there is an incoming message. This one's from Liam with a little note about Jedis. Play. Hey, guys. It's Liam from Long Island. I just wanted to mention, uh, comment on the 408 about the different religions. Uh, in the U.S. military, Jedi is an official and uh, recognized religion. Uh, quite a few members of the armed services have Jedi on their dog tag. Thank you. Have a great day. That's pretty awesome. In fact, I feel like maybe we read this before or talked about it. Maybe I talked about it on Current Geek or something when that was... When that happened. But this is the U.S. military recognizing it as yeah. a natural religion. That's kind of neat. We thank the Jedi for their service. And we thank you for your service. Well, on to the emails. Uh, yesterday's show featured a new GUI that tracks eye movement. Fast Eddie B. in Georgia writes in and says, Along the lines of nothing new under the sun, I was reminded of an ad and a product from 1985. Now there's a mouse that flies. <laughs> Wow, that is a 1985 ad for yeah, sure. Uh, he found the instruction <laughs> manual online as well. It was a device you wore on your head like a headset. Uh, a box sat on the Mac and tracked your head movement with two buttons attached to your keyboard to initiate tracking and to click. I bought one for $199, and it worked very well. It was an elegant interface, and it was really impressive to watch the cursor move and menus drop down depending on where you looked. I could no longer use it once the Mac moved away from ADB, though I recall later seeing it marketed to the handicap, though at a much higher price. Anyway, uh, thanks for the nostalgia. That is fantastic because that is operationally the exact same system that we saw yesterday uh, in a, you know, in 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 the uh, in the system yesterday, you didn't have to wear anything. That's the only difference. It's tracking your eye movements directly, uh, whereas the headset was doing it in this old version. But otherwise, the 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 you know, pressing a button to let it know you're tracking, pressing a button to click, that's all the same. And strangely, I think the headset might be more accurate because it's not trying to track your eyes as you're moving around. I mean, you have this thing on your head. Why now, not? why do you say that? Why? Why do you say that? The headset's going to be more accurate. No, but I mean, like now, today's technology. If you if you can kind of marry those together, it'd be a little. It might be a little you easier. You want to wear the headset? I'd love to is. wear the headset. You but just, I kind of you want just like think it looks cool. the, the LaForge kind of thing. You don't know that it's more accurate, though. I didn't say I know that. I'm uh, saying I think it could be. Yeah, I I think pigs could fly too. But okay, that good mean for you. Will. Well, you know how like the PlayStation Move has a little dot instead of using the trackers. It's 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 just a different method. Yeah, you just want to wear the headset. Yeah, you like headsets, huh? Yes, I do. I like headsets. <laughs> Big headset fan. You know that we're still doing a show, right? Yeah, we are. Uh, that's, in fact, no, we're not. That's, that's it. <laughs> show's over. When, when that what discussion people, happens, we're done. What are you people still doing here? Uh, thanks to, for submitting stories at technewstoday.reddit.com. That's our subreddit. Go in there and join the 4,000 people uh, who submit stories and vote them up or down, letting us know what stuff they want to hear. The voting it's is Reddit the 4K. most important it is. That's right. All you need is it's 3D. the 4K Reddit camera. Mm -hmm. at technewstoday.reddit.com. Also, uh, just a reminder, it's never too early to suggest best of moments. Just put best of in the subject line of an email to tnt at twit.tv if one of the moments that you've seen so far this year you think is memorable. I know it's only the 6th of January, but we want to make ja Jason's yes. job as simple as possible at the end of this year. So we're reminding you now. Let's do this slowly throughout the year. That's Help it for... 
this episode of Tech News Today. Twit.tv slash TNT is the website. Uh, our email address is TNT at twit.tv. And our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. John Strickland will be on the show Monday live from Las Vegas, Nevada at the Consumer Electronics Show. We'll see, we'll see you then.